Dr. Florence Gaub is a senior analyst at the European Union Institute for Security Studies, where she heads the Middle East and North Africa program. In her work, she focuses on conflict, strategy and security, with particular emphasis on Iraq, Lebanon and Libya. She also works on Arab military forces more generally, conflict structures and geostrategic dimensions of the Arab region. Uh, Dr. Gal wrote a paper called The Cult of ISIS, which was published in Survival, Global Politics and Strategy in early 2016. Uh, I asked Dr. Gal about the links that can be made between cults and terrorist groups and the strategic implications of these links. Dr. Florence Gal, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to talk to you today. Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm very good. Um, so I suppose the, the, the first place to start would be to ask uh, how you got into this in, in the first place. Um, well, you're probably familiar with um, the use of the word cult in the context of ISIS by certain politicians, but that's not why I looked into it. I mean, I was familiar with the term, but the main reason I looked into it is because I watched a documentary about Scientology. And the documentary, it was on Netflix called Clear. I actually watched, this is the, the, the weird part of the story because I read an article about Tom Cruise. So right. it's really Tom Cruise who got me to think about this. And while I was watching <laughs> this documentary, mainly driven by my 1980s crush on Tom Cruise, um, this is, was a documentary um, made by people who had left Scientology and they were describing their experience in the, in the organization, I realized that they share a lot of um, traits with the terrorist organizations in general, but in general, but particularly with, with ISIS. And mm -hmm. that's why I started digging deeper into it. I mean, there's a body of research on this, but really it is this um, accidental discovery that Scientology and ISIS have certain things in common that got me into this, and it's basically all Tom Cruise's fault. <laughs> so we have Tom to blame for this. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, that's the uh, documentary Going Clear, I think. Clear, yes, exactly, exactly. Exactly, cool. Um, and so that's what led you to writing this paper, which you wrote um, a couple of years ago now, The Cult of ISIS? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so could you just talk a little bit about this paper? It's, it's talking about the uh, strategic implications of viewing ISIS as not just a terrorist group, but also something yes. a little bit cultic. Exactly. When you look at, so what I started doing after watching that documentary, I looked into uh, basically in parallel the two different types of organizations, so the cults and terrorist organizations. How do they um, recruit? How do they identify the targets that they're looking for? What do they do with the individuals once they have them uh, in their, under their control? What are the mechanisms to hold them? What are the mechanisms to motivate them, to keep them committed to the organization? And then once they have that loyalty, what do they do with it? And I discovered, um, I was really astonished that the similarities were actually so important that I'm not even sure the, the theoretical distinctions between the two organizations or types of organizations are, are that important. Because I think that it's really blurry because they both use uh, so many um, uh, similar approaches. Now, they don't necessarily use these individuals for the same purpose, but it's very, very similar in terms of, yeah, the people they're looking for and then what they do with them. It's almost mm. identical. Yeah, they're both quite strategic in the way that they go about utilizing uh, the, the members of, of the groups, right? Well, essentially what they both have in common and where a cult is particularly different from a religion, because that, that was the trickiest part. It's, I mean, we all know more or less what a terrorist organization is. Uh, it's an organization that uses asymmetric means essentially to scare a wider population. Uh, a cult is a bit more difficult to uh, define because people confuse them with sects. Now, a sect is a very small religious organization, but a cult, you could argue, yeah, it's also a small religious organization, but the main difference between religions and cults is that cults establish many authoritarian systems. So their main objective is to establish totalitarian control over a group of people to then use them for a for different purpose. Now, for cults, that's mostly uh, self-serving, so to, I don't know, enrichment of the leadership uh, and so forth, whereas terrorist organizations then 
go a step further and, and use that loyalty or the totalitarian control that they've established over this group of people to achieve political means. But until that step, what do we do now with this control? They're really identical. And the strategic implication is this is why we don't care so much about cults, because they don't do harm to a wider population. They only do harm to the people that are in the organization. But the terrorist organization will use that strong bond they have created with these individuals uh, for very destructive effects. So terrorist attacks, obviously, uh, suicide bombings. Uh, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be just violent. It could also be hate speech uh, and all the, let's say, logistical aspects that also play an important role in in terrorism, that's what they use them for. And what that means for us who are fighting terrorist organizations is that we have to understand the bond, this, 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 the, the real added value for, for an organization is not that just someone shows up and wants to join the club, but he or she will be very, very committed thanks to that bond. So for us, it means looking stronger, deeper into the recruitment process, into all these mechanisms that they are then uh, used once they are in the in the club, so to speak, to keep them in the organization. That is, I think, really misunderstood and, and not really taken enough into account, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot there going on. I mean, you, you're talking about bonding. The, the overlap there seems to be uh, hitting on two key things. Uh, it's this totalitarian control uh, as well as this deep bonding of the of the members, uh, this seems to be the thing that ties terrorist yeah, yes, groups and, and it's, cults. It's, it's, it's very, very uh, sophisticated psychological uh, tools, essentially, that they both use. So it starts with, um, well, firstly, identifying the target. And thanks to modern technology, that's easier for ISIS today than it was for Scientology, let's say, in the 70s and 80s. But... Um, it's not enough to know that somebody is a sympathizer, then you have to understand the psychological profile of that person, what will make him or her uh, an ideal target. And the, there are different types. I mean, contrary to what the media are telling us, there isn't just one sick individual at home that can be someone who responds well to humanitarian things, someone who responds well to uh, uh, the appeal of a community and so forth. So there are different types. But mm. they're very skilled in, in figuring out who this individual is that they're talking to. And um, then a conversation is established. And then once there is already a certain proximity and understanding of uh, what the individual in question will need, then the, the, the crucial step is to get them, in the case of ISIS, to leave their families and to come to Syria and Iraq. That's what all cults do. Cults break the bond an individual has with his or her family, friends, and regular environment. Why? Because once you are detached from everything that gives you a sense of normality, you are much easier uh, to be influenced. And so then once you are, well, not you, obviously, but once the individual is in, in, in an area under the control, that's when the real work begins. You know, be it military training, even more isolation, a highly regulated access to uh, food to anything recreational, which then creates a psychological dependency between the individual and the organization. And that, uh, up to that point, there is virtually no distinction between ISIS and uh, and, and other cults. So th that is very sophisticated. But I think one important point to remember is that they look at both cults and terrorist organizations or, or terrorist organizations that use cultish methods are looking for individuals that have a certain sense of void in their lives. Mm, right. So there can be something that each of us has probably experienced at some point, you know, a sense of loss after a breakup, after divorce, change of job, change of school, change of apartment. It can be anything that leads to just a mild depression. You don't have to be crazy or, or really fully depressed to have that sense of um, void and, and lack of connect connection to other people. And that's where they... So basically, that's uh, potentially a large group of people, and that's where they're terribly skilled at finding uh, and opening that, let's say, that small crack and turning it into a uh, large, large window of opportunity for them to go into. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, you're saying that this sort of lack of meaning in someone's life, it could be uh, something that drives them to be more susceptible, perhaps, to, to the message that uh, ISIS, um, for example, would, would put out. Um, but it also seems the case that there are multiple pathways in. 
Um, would, would you say that it's possible for someone to, to go into this, uh, you know, to join a group like ISIS and, and to, to really know what they're getting themselves in for? Or would you say it's always the case that they, they've been tricked in some way? Well, yes. So firstly, yes, there are, there are different pathways in, and that's why it's also so complex for law enforcement to establish a profile. Um, there is, of course, a preference to, to, to establish a profile based on age and gender and perhaps religion, but the variety we see with, with ISIS in, in all these regards, I mean, we have a certain age bracket, we have a certain tendency in terms of religion, but sure. we have 25% of converts, we have people from the most uh, isolated parts of France that convert to Islam and then join ISIS. So, the, so there is no one explanation. It's not the average young Arab from the suburb of Paris that's really angry at the central state and will pick up weapons. It's much more complex than that. Um, so the different pathways, as I said, the recruiter will have to understand what this individual requires the most. I mean, as I mentioned, a void, but that void can be filled by many different things. Um, meaning, meaning can be filled with, depending on the individual, with a sense of connection. So that can be appealing to um, uh, the individual's need for being part of a group. So you say you come to us, you will be part of a like-minded group, you will never be alone again. Then some young men respond very well to that appeal of uh, uh, warfare and you know be a hero and a warrior for once. Uh, others, uh, women in particular, but not exclusively so, respond very well to the humanitarian appeal. You know, come and help fight uh, people killing Syrian children, and uh, and again others uh, have a desire for meaning and and let's say rejuvenation or restart. So with those, you can actually. Uh, appeal to, well, you know, you can offer the very pure, I mean, in, in brackets, you know, but pure Islamic lifestyle. And in that sense, right. it's, it's leaving this decadent Western world behind and get something really pure and, and, and so forth. So there are many different ways to get in. In that sense, nobody is tricked because they will get what they've been offered. And for instance, for, for uh, cult members writ, writ large, after joining a cult, initially happiness levels go up because the cult gives them something they were looking for, and I think it's the same with ISIS. So it's not, it's, it's you know, the human psyche is, is a truly phenomenal thing because it's not as simple as, oh, once they get there, they see the violence, they change their minds. I mean, I'm pretty sure that everybody sees once they're in the territory that not everything was as they imagined, but what in the recruitment process was offered that they usually get. But they didn't realize perhaps that they were also signing up to uh, seeing a lot of dead bodies, uh, that they would be submitted to airstrikes and so forth. But even that can be rationalized away because if the organization gives you a lot of positive other things in return, you will be uh, inclined to blame uh, the Western world or United States or it's whatever or a single individual that went off track. So it's, it's, there is a very intricate psychological process in place. But tricking people, I think that is not the case. They are usually offered something and they do get that what they've been offered. Right, right. Okay, so what would you say are the most important implications of viewing ISIS and other terrorist groups as, uh, as being also cultic would you say it's mainly in the recruitment process or and the return because right uh, we have never had uh, such a large group of Europeans joining uh, one single entity I mean we've had other terrorist organizations before obviously uh, but uh, they came they didn't draw uh, from many European countries at the same time so in that sense it's very international obviously uh, so suddenly we are wondering what will we do with these 5,000 people that come back? Although I think actually of the 5,000, 1,000 have been killed. And uh, so, but let's say 4,000 come back. Uh, that's a truly astonishing number. And I think here the that's, reaction uh, has... That's 4,000 back into Europe as a whole, is it? Uh, that would, well, the, the potential that, that could come back. So far, I think 1,500 have come back. And there are still um, 2,500 in Syria and Iraq. This right. is the latest number, but let's just take them as a symbolic number because we don't know 
for sure. But it's an it's a it's a very big cohort, and so the uh, policymakers' reaction is to, well, to look at that huge task and obviously hope that perhaps some uh, are traumatized and want to just return to a normal life and. Uh, never hear from ISIS again, and then so the question is, what do we do with these people? We, ha I think, we have an understanding that if we do absolutely nothing, then we we'll create a problem. But what is it that we do? And I think here the cult dimension is very important. It's my opinion that, in my opinion, considering that the recruitment process and the socialization process, once they're in the organization, is so highly psychological and individual that you cannot de-radicalize um, gr in a group collectively you know you, you can't just put them all in a place and then give them right. lessons on citizenship mm. or democracy i don't think that's what's going to work it's, it's going to be much much more complex than that and unfortunately the de-radicalization programs we've had so far are not terribly successful in breaking this bond between the individual and the organization even if a lot of truly negative things have happened and we know this from literature on cults in the 1970s um, unless an individual truly wants to leave this ideology behind, uh, he or she will be inclined to maintain a certain bond with that cult. And that means that we probably have to deal with, well, maybe like, uh, well, let's say alcoholics that stop drinking, people that that can function without it, but that will feel a certain tendency in that direction for a very long time, particularly, maybe forever, yeah. yeah, maybe even forever, particularly for those who stayed for more than a year. I mean, after a year, it's kind of a break. If you've stayed in, in a cult for a year or longer, then you're very, very likely to yeah, have a lifelong attachment to this organization. And we don't really know in policy terms how to handle that because it's a huge number, uh, number one. Number two, there is a desire to just solve the problem quickly when probably you would need psychological care for a longer time and then what do we do with people who don't really want to de-radicalize but yes they want to have a normal life in Europe but they will always feel emotionally attached to an organization that is fundamentally uh, an enemy of of our well values um, and I think we have not really thought that through what that means um, because it, I see a potential lingering pool of recruits for a future organization or well for ISIS even now calling on terrorists uh, for, for terrorist attacks committed by these people. So it's, it's a combination of a security issue and a psychological issue that we're not really prepared to deal with. There was um, a, a de-radicalization center was shut down in, in, in France this year, I think. Uh, yes. Because it, yeah. So th something isn't working, clearly. Um, in, the, in this paper, uh, The Cult of ISIS, you, you, you mentioned one of the potential solutions might be to try and enable uh, people to escape uh, from from groups like ISIS, uh, perhaps by offering deals or maybe an amnesty or, or something like this. It, but I'm not, I'm not sure that there's much political appetite for that. You know, there's a lot of people who would say some, you know, things like, "Well, just throw their passports away." You know, that these people are beyond. Help! We, we beyond help. We don't want these people back, sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, don't forget, I wrote that two years ago. So um, at that time, I thought that at least for those that that displayed a willingness to break with the organization, maybe we could give them an option. But we are now at a stage where. Probably of, of all the returnees, it's very distinct, different, difficult to distinguish between them that they're actually generally interested in leaving the organization and those that are just keen to escape uh, the legal consequences of their actions. So I'm afraid that I'm I, I'm more on the, um, uh, the not deterrent side. I'm more um, convinced that we we cannot uh, because it's such a psychological issue and because we don't know how to handle it, I, I'm afraid that the, the only consequence for now is to uh, convict those that committed crimes and put them in prison and then we'll see or hope that by the time they're older they just don't have an appetite to conduct terrorist attacks. I think that at least you, you might not de-radicalize them but you, might, but you will be able to stop them from conducting attacks.
But as you said, the appetite, I think, in Europe, it, it depends very much on the country. In Germany, I see a tendency to be more inclined to offer amnesties and, and to go into psychological care. Uh, I think in France, the appetite for that is completely dead after the... Actually, it's not just one thing, it's two de-radicalization programs that uh, proved to be failures ranging from, I don't know, the poster girl for de-radicalization traveling to Syria shortly afterwards, uh, this shutdown center and so forth. So I think in France, it's it's a very disillusioned uh, moment when it comes to that. And the consequence will be, uh, let's just build more prisons and lock them up. Um, that is the only solution, but it's not a solution. It's just a measure, I would say, uh, because we have exactly... You, ha you, you asked me in one of your messages, wouldn't it be easier to teach people resilience? I think it's an extraordinary question, but it really shows us that in our educational system, there's very little taught in the sense of how do I deal with frustration, how do I deal with loneliness, how do I deal with uh, lack of meaning and so forth. I mean, this is really, we are almost in the philosophical realm now. And, it gets and quite states, deep, doesn't it? Yes, the states yeah. don't really teach that. Uh, but you're right, probably they should, because there's a huge part of that that we that that we will encounter in our adults life and we don't know how to handle and it is very easy for such groups to manipulate people that that feel yeah lonely and meaningless and so forth mm. yeah that i mean in that message that i sent i was i was saying something like that all prevention strategies uh, they seem to come at the problem of radicalization a little bit too late in the game um by the time someone's acted they've probably radicalized in the mind uh, perhaps a long time before, and they're just waiting for the opportunity to act it out, sort of thing. So perhaps resilience is, is, would be a more successful long-term strategy compared to, say, awareness or, or, or merely surveillance, you know, monitoring people. Um, but you, you mentioned something just now about how cultic experts could really play a, a, quite a, a key role in, in uh, de-radicalization in terms of their experience with helping people to re-socialize from, from, these, from these environments. Is that where you see that uh, cultic research is perhaps best utilized in, in security studies at the moment? Um, yeah, I think in general I'm a, I'm a big fan of tearing down these walls between the, the social sciences because ultimately it's artificial. We need to understand humanity as a very interesting phenomenon and that includes everything from uh, philosophy to economy to political science to, to uh, psychology. And uh, so for me, any, you know, I, I also work on, on military forces and for that I actually ventured out into sociology and everything sociology says about organizations in general, not just military organizations. So we can learn a lot by cross-fertilizing thoughts and um, the best ideas I always have when I venture out into something that is entirely out of my home discipline, which is political science, you know, by watching that documentary about something that I have no connection to, that actually gives me the biggest um, uh -huh moments where I want to dig deeper. Right. So cult experts definitely in security studies, but also in, in, in political science, uh, in anything that's related to, well, the existence of humans uh, writ large, they have a lot to offer and they should be included more. The same goes for uh, economists, uh, there's even a link between, or not so obvious link between economy and psychology, you know, unemployed people, obviously they're, they're easier radicalized than employed people. So what is the link there? Is there something we could look uh, deeper into? I mean, we look, we know that there is a link somewhere between uh, poverty, unemployment and radicalization, but it's not clear cut. Not every poor uh, unemployed person will radicalize. So what's the difference between those who do and those who don't? So these are all very, very interesting questions for researchers to dig deeper into and it requires a much broader interdisciplinary approach um, to do that effectively. Mm, so you're talking about more interdisciplinarity, more communication between the fields uh, Absolutely. Sort of going on. Um, one one question I wanted to ask you was about definitions. Um, so this is, you know, you, you can you can look at cults and you can look at terrorist groups. And one of the key similarities for me is that it, it's really hard to define what these things are. You know, definitions of cult and terrorism they're they're very nebulous. Um, what what definition is the best one to use, and how do how do we go about defining 
these things. In the case of uh, terrorism, especially, um, you know, where we avoid the idea of uh, state-sponsored terrorism, perhaps. Um, oh. It seems, yeah, it seems like the definition could be seen as agenda-driven. There's like there's an agenda behind it. Yeah, of course. I mean, every definition is, is uh, by default, it says a lot about the pe people who use it and who prefer it. Um, I think the first thing to understand is that in order to define something, you have to truly understand it. And it, so that means understanding who does what, with what means and why. And, and then it, 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 it requires quite a lot of work uh, to come up with a very succinct definition. For me, terrorism, and I looked at this um, before even 2001, because, um, uh, yeah, again, one of those cross-fertilizing moments when I looked at a, a play by Albert Camus about terrorists uh, in Tsarist Russia. And, uh, and I, li I still like that definition that antedated this whole Islamist wave because it was more neutral. And uh, if you want, we can talk about this Islam, uh, Islamic agenda in a second because it's an important dimension. But the definition used then was that terrorism is a tactic used by a small group to, to intimidate a majority or a larger group with asymmetric means. So, I mean, the, the term obviously comes from fear, terror, terror, but it is by default an asymmetric um, tactic. So it means that it's a smaller group trying to act on a larger group and ideally trying to get through this action uh, the, small, the larger group to um, act in a certain way. So, um, as an example, in, in the case of ISIS, ISIS will use terrorism in Europe to polarize European societies, ideally to provoke a civil war between the Muslim minority and the mm. non-Muslim majority. Um, but that, uh, or, or let's look at the IRA, the IRA used terrorism in the UK to get the government to change its uh, political stance in Northern Ireland. So it, this would be my definition because it's it's quite neutral and I think it applies to nearly every um, every case. Sp State-sponsored terrorism is, I think, still uses a small group to serve its own means. So that that, that would actually broaden the question. And okay, who who helps this small group to use terrorist methods on a larger group? But um, by definition, because it's an asymmetric tactic the individuals or the groups using terrorist taxes will be in the minority. And and I think this is something that, because we're so scared of them, we often forget that they are the minority. That's why they're using this tactic. So they are, by definition, the weaker party. But that's why they have to use fear to make uh, themselves look bigger and us make, make us feel smaller. Mm. Um, a cult is an organization that, uh, so in contrast to, to terrorist groups, uh, that uses um, religious rhetoric, i.e. Um, rhetoric that explains the meaning of life and the universe and so forth, to establish uh, authoritarian control over a group of people. And and the objective then is, is normally for the leadership to, to take advantage of that, be it in financial terms and sociological terms and, and all kinds of terms. So that's why it overlaps. Um, a terrorist group will will absorb cultic features, but then use it to 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 perpetrate ter terrorist attacks. A cult will not necessarily do that. These will be the definitions that that I that I prefer because they're very much neutral in a sense that it's about who does what, why, and with what means. Mm. Yeah, I think the the point I was trying to get at was that no one really self identifies as being a member of a cult or a member of a terrorist group, say. Um, you know, the, the <laughs> old saying, <laughs> one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, of course, once you're inside, you've bought into the narrative and you think you're, you're right. Uh, and one, one interesting uh, fact I found was that uh, we talk a lot about this uh, doomsday uh, narrative of ISIS and the fact that you know, suicides that to us uh, seem the most, well, absurd act of violence because it doesn't even serve the person who committed the act. Um, but that's actually very, very common in terrorist, or, and, sorry, in cults. So um, be it um, the, 
the you this UFO cult, I can't remember the name now, collective suicide is very, very common. And so is uh, mm. this this idea that only Are the you talking about the Heaven's cult, Gate there? Sorry. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Heaven's Gate, yeah. thank you. Um, or this idea that only the in group knows that it's the uh, end times. That all of this actually serves the purpose to create cohesion to the inside, to strengthen the authoritarian control over a small group of people, over a larger uh, group. So th th it all has the same mechanisms, really. Mm -hmm. So that that sort of leads me on nicely to uh, the the next question, which is, uh, you know, why has there been such a focus on ideology uh, and you know Muslim minority issues uh, instead of these processes why are we it's like uh, some of these political leaders seem to have taken the bait sort of thing <laughs> why why is this yes you're right some some of us have taken the bait i think it's uh, it's a lot easier for people to talk about uh, islam i mean we're talking about westerners europeans here as a religion that they don't know very well as a religion that is practiced by uh, usually a minority in their country that uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases has not integrated terribly well. So it becomes this exotic foreign other. And so in that process of othering, um, it's easier or it's more interesting to talk about that than to talk about something fairly neutral um, that is uh, the ideology. I mean, not neutral, but ideology, if you, if you take it out of the Islamic context, because that's what it is. Uh, is in itself not so emotional, whereas where ISIS has been very successful is actually essentially taking a lot of the stereotypes that certain that a lot of people have in Europe about Islam, saying yes, everything that you believe that's bad about Islam that is actually Islamic, and we think it's good. Of course, the the vast majority of Muslims, including a lot of Muslim clerics, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the letter to Baghdadi by, I think, signed 150 uh, famous uh, Islamic uh, scholars, they, will di they disagree with ISIS. But the question is not, is ISIS Islamic or not? But the question is, um, because essentially every every cult will use religious narratives to give itself legitimacy. So you have numerous numerous Christian, I mean, cults that use Christian and Jewish uh, narratives to give themselves to lend themselves a degree of legitimacy. So of course there are also cults that use Islamic narratives. Um, but the, for us, I, I agree with you in that the focusing on Islam and how it's linked to terrorism doesn't give us the, the answer to the real question. That is, why do people radicalize? Why do they become a security issue for us? What can we do about this? There is no discussion about Islam that will give us the solution. Because every cult, every terrorist organization will pick and choose uh, from, from a large body of, of uh, um, well, religious, religious uh, texts to justify themselves. But if you look at Scientology, this is one of the cults that actually completely made up. It's, it's I mean, not made yeah, it's up. It's quite but blatant as well. Yeah. It's, it's quite blatant. It has nothing to do with mainstream Christianity or Judaism or any of the other monotheistic religions. Um, but people in the cult believe that as well. So it's put completely irrelevant what they're taught to believe. What interests me as a researcher is not what they believe in, but why do they believe in it? And I think this is the question that's much more tricky to answer. And that's why people prefer to focus on Islam, which is in any case, we are in, a, in an environment that is now uh, Islamophobic. Uh, and so it's, it's a lot more emotional and it's easier to point fingers and say this is all their fault. But uh, I think it's much more complex than that. And this maybe speaks to this, uh, this idea that we're looking for quick solutions uh, to this, um, which is perhaps the wrong approach. Um, yes, so, we, we some, do, yeah. Mm, um, something I wanted to ask you about was um, recruitment strategies of, of terrorist groups um, like ISIS who are, you know, perhaps cultic in, in the way that they go about things. It's a, it's a sort of propaganda um, scheme that they have going on. Um, and in, in some sense, it's, it's quite clever the way that they are recruiting people. I mean, you, you've talked in your research about targeting of uh, women uh, and talk, uh, talking about targeting petty criminals um, you know and they're quite selective in the way that they go about you know uh, trying to attract these people into the group um, 
you know, can, do, I suppose one one question I'd be interested to hear the answer to would, uh, you know, can we trace a pattern uh, from the types of recruitment that we're seeing uh, to perhaps group goals? Is there a sort of strategic, you know, something strategic we can get out of that? Yeah, I think it's uh, what what's really interesting about ISIS is that it has been a very very clever and much more. Um, targeted and strategic in its recruitment process than perhaps other organizations. Um, in the sense that uh, you mentioned the petty criminals, uh, I think two thirds of, or even more depending on country, of European uh, fighters that joined ISIS had a petty criminal history. Um, interestingly, I think only about 30% of them say that they were radicalized in prison. Um, I mean, pr prison, a Prison sentences appear at some point in a lot of the terrorist uh, CVs, but it's not the prison itself that radicalizes people. So to me, mean, that means that there is an, a, a history of uh, struggling with society, with the rules of society, of the state, and then it's in that struggle that the organization cleverly taps into. But in addition, petty criminals have a fountain of knowledge that is of of a lot of interest to ISIS. I mean, um, mm. pr procuring money illegally means that uh, you, you know, a lot of the uh, international laws targeting uh, the financing of terrorism actually focus on organized crime and on, on money laundering and so forth, but all rather collective and actually very big sums. Now, a lot of the terrorist attacks in Europe, for instance, were funded with very, well, very little money and usually generated small through... Small amounts of money, yeah. Yeah, small amounts of money and petty crime. So, I don't know, credit card fraud, uh, uh, fake sneaker sales, uh, drug sales, and so forth. And that is very interesting because it flies under the radar of law enforcement. I mean, of course, law enforcement looks at petty criminals, but not with a terrorist eye. You know, it's not seen as a security issue. It's seen as a well, an economic issue, maybe a social issue, but that's it. So there, there is definitely ISIS is different in that from Al Qaeda, which did not had, did not have a preference for criminals, because Al Qaeda looked more at people that were ideologically sounder than in their operational capacity to act. I think ISIS has been very clever in that. Of course, the next step is ISIS also targets uh, chemists and biologists in the view of. Uh, potentially um, manufacturing IEDs, uh, be it mm. in Europe or in their territories. And of course, lastly, uh, the famous call by Baghdadi when he declared the caliphate, he did call on doctors and, and uh, engineers and anyone that's, uh, that's helpful to them in, in building their state, so to say. But to my knowledge, it was not particularly successful in attracting doctors and engineers. I mean, it is particularly attractive to people that have nothing to lose in that sense and that that want a new start in life i think one of the posters that isis uh, put out there for for uh, well to target petty criminals was um uh, the people with the people with the worst past very often have the best future or something like this yes i was so surprised really, to see that yeah, slogan, yeah. well it, it it really offers you who's unhappy in his current life and who feels rejected by society perhaps after a prison stay or mm. conviction or whatever, um, yeah, I have a new life for you and I'll, I'll make it count. So the recruitment pattern is, is insightful, but I think it goes beyond just a state building project. I think it also goes to the other level, which is operational capacity, recruiting people that already know how to smuggle power, stuff into a country, out of a country, be it money or weapons or, or fake passports, everything that you need uh, as a terrorist, you will also need as a petty criminal. And I think that shows us that there the, their end game in, in Europe is, and I think we're in for quite a long time when it comes to at least their will to strike, at least at a low level, uh, terrorist mm. attacks. And they're utilizing people who have these underworld skills yes. um, in particular. Mm. Uh, but we didn't talk about the women. Do you want to say um, something about yeah, the women? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, this. Especially for the women, it, it, it does seem quite unusual to, to think of a woman putting themselves willingly into this situation. Um, I, I, I mean, it's a similar question to, to one I asked earlier. Do, do these women really know what they're getting themselves into? Uh, um, I think there, there are two things that, that I, that I want to say to the question of women in ISIS. I think the first one is that we misunderstand 
I mean, uh, there is a study done that has nothing to do with ISIS, but about uh, female happiness in the United States. And it's a long-term study that started in, I think, the late 60s. And it did show that women are today unhappier than they were in the 70s. And the, the, the conclusion, the wrong conclusion would be to say feminism doesn't make women happy. But I think it's a bit more complex than that because we have not established feminism in that sense. Most women, uh, at least that take part in that study, juggle both. So women have not achieved parity in that sense. They still they are now allowed to work, but at home they still uh, do perform most of the household duties. So for a woman in the UK or in France today, it's quite a confusing place to be in. They're kind of stuck between the old and the new. And some... Mm. Those that uh, struggle with this, uh, well, un somewhat unclear gender situation, they will perceive an organization like ISIS that offers them very clear guidelines for what it means to be a woman appealing. Um, but what is interesting, and I think that that's the second point that's important for me uh, when it comes to women in ISIS, particularly the Europeans, is that when they choose to join the organization, they do that out of a very feminist mindset. Because I've noticed that most of the women in ISIS, uh, the non-Syrian, non-Iraqi, are actually Europeans, not from, uh, from the Arab world. Why? Because they can actually travel by themselves. They can uh, procure themselves the money to do so. Uh, they're much freer. And most importantly, they see themselves also as agents of their lives. So they, this is my life, I will do what I want with it, and I will join this terrorist organization. So it's kind of a, like a feminist <laughs> joke on them in the, in the end that they end up in this hugely anti-feminist organization because they want to take agency. Um, once they're there, I think they, there is a difference for the Europeans and the Arab women in the sense that the Europeans uh, enjoy a higher status, especially the converts, and that they will very often not just play the role of housewife and, and mother, that they will play a role on social media, uh, in that they will play a role in, in recruitment. Very often they are there to recruit other women. Um, that they often also play the role of, I don't know if you call that in English, in French you call it pigeon, you know, who transport uh, messages in and out uh, of the territory. So there's okay, an operational yeah. dimension to it. So... Um, but your question was, do they know what they were getting into? I think some of them struggled with the reality, uh, especially because for the women, there is, there's a dimension that's not there for the men, and that is the intimate relationships. That, um, okay, maybe you arrive there and you, well, if, if a woman arrives there and is not married, then she's expected to get married. And, okay, maybe she falls in love with this guy, but if he dies on the... Um, in battle, then she has to marry someone else rather quickly. And I think there's this emotional dimension that maybe was is underestimated by some of them, um, and that makes it a lot more intimate and requires a lot more personal um, commitment than it does of the men. So I think for the women, um, it, in, uh, it has been at times a lot more difficult because it requires more of their personal well intimacy and commitment. But as a whole, I think... Even for them, it is a rewarding experience, and exactly as for the men, and this is where, again, this, this uh, 1950s rhetoric of, of, of ISIS is kind of misleading, because the women join, for, there are studies done on that, the women join for the same reasons as the men. Maybe they don't want to fight on the front line in the way the men do, but they also want meaning, they also want uh, a new start in life, they, they might even have, well, they have less petty criminal antecedents, but they feel as excluded from their society and from uh, their, 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 their normal lives as the men do. And so in, in that sense, they're very, very similar, and I think it must be understood also is that, that when they come back, a lot of them say, play that 50s house card, housewife card back at us and say, oh, I was manipulated by my husband or by the recruiter and I'm just an, a stupid woman. But I think they know very well what they got into or they were, in most cases, intelligent enough and had agency enough to take a very important decision like that. Mm. And I think they must be held accountable for it in the same way as the men are. You had, uh, I think you have personal experience. Uh, you were involved with um, the, the court case of Tarina Shakir. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the British woman who went to uh, Syria, was it, uh, with her toddlers? Um, yeah. And then, and then came back and was convicted. Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess, I mean, we're getting towards the end of the interview here. Um, I guess uh, just a very broad sort of question would be, um, you know, what, what can cultic researchers learn from, from the way that security uh, researchers are, are approaching the problem of terrorism? Is there anything, you know, it, se it seems like we're talking all, all about cultic researchers uh, influence, you know, being able to help with the problem of terrorism. Is there anything that we could bring back uh, for, you know, to try and approach the problem of cults? Well, I think where what, what, what cult researchers can look at, what we look at, is essentially it's, it's a, we we pick up where they where they end. So uh, uh, researchers that work on cults, they are mainly interested in the recruitment and what happens in the cult and um, maybe after they leave. But the questions that cultic researchers don't ask is what do the uh, cults do with this power that they have over the people? What's the objective of the cult? And I think that's what, of course, you know, political scientists or security studies researchers, we are mainly interested in what do they do with it. We don't look so much at what's going on inside. I think that both, but though both questions belong together. And I think it'd be beneficial if, if us political scientists, we look at uh, the recruitment process and this, the psychological and sociological stuff that's going on in a cult. Um, to learn from it and apply it to terrorist organizations, but equally for cultic researchers to look at what is it that the leadership does, you know, dig deeper into this mm -hmm. authoritarian control, because th really what I've understood now from ISIS is that the line, the fine, is, is so fine that we see a lot of potential for essentially any cult moving from cult into terrorist activity, because they have the capacity to do that. It's a bit like, uh, yeah, a bit like the like a plutonium program yes you have plutonium that's not a nuclear weapon but it might get you there in a sense a cult is like that it's not yet a terrorist organization but it has the capacity to become one very quickly because it has a, a um, large uh, cohort of people under their control so committed to this organization that they're virtually willing to kill themselves and that is an interesting question to look at uh, also in security terms yeah, I think it's a huge, hugely interesting question. I mean, it seems like any ideology has the potential to turn rotten, you know, fairly quickly. It just needs the the right ingredients, you know. No, that that's not. I, I don't think that's useful. I mean, the ideology is, in a sense, like the fuel you put in the car. So, the the problem is the car. It's not it's not the fuel in itself because it wouldn't run. But if you didn't have the car, then the whole fuel would be pointless. So for me, the whole focus on ideology is, is misleading. It doesn't, it doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't give us the answer. Um, I was just in Iraq last week, and we had a discussion with Iraqis who were convinced that it's all about ideology and all we need is education and tell people what the right Islam is. Uh, and I disagree with that. I think it starts much, much earlier, and ideology comes in later in the game. Uh, so what you mentioned about resilience, about psychology, about recruitment mm. tactics and so forth, I think precedes the ideological component. And all the people who joined ISIS and buying ISIS and Islam for dummies before they left are proof mm. uh, of that statement. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I've probably put it in, in a very bad way there, but I, I think what I was trying to say is something like that any group can turn into a sort of terrorist group. Uh, yes, absolutely. Quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so... I think we can wrap it up there, um, if, if, unless you have anything else to say. No, I think again, it's a it's a very interesting topic. Uh, we need we need the more cross fertilizing we do, the better it is, uh, and the more questions are asked out of the box, uh, the better. So it is for every researcher advisable to watch documentaries and go to exhibits <laughs> they would never go to, uh, just because of Tom Cruise to get new ideas. And essentially, the best researchers are those that get new ideas, and that's what we need right now. Well, thank you, Tom Cruise, and uh, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Florence Galb. Uh, okay, that was thank brilliant. You thank you.